Hello people of the future and welcome to Let's Make a Trading Card Game. I've been working on the new uh, card set and I've changed a few things around since last time. So um, each color has their own identity, has their own philosophy and I haven't been changing them. Those are pretty much settled at this point. By, but I've been tweaking sort of the effects that each color has access to. Um, because when actually making cards that uh, follow the strategies and follow the philosophies of the colors, uh, it turned out that some colors had a wider range of possibilities of effects that they had access to. For example, blue, uh, which is the color of knowledge, and they go about uh, uh, conquering the galaxy by gaining more information than their opponents and planning forward, sort of outsmarting their opponents. And when you think in those terms uh, and think what kind of uh, effects would go into the blue color and you know onto blue cards, you start thinking of uh, well, exploring the galaxy is sort of uh, uh, the first things that come to mind because uh, um, exploring means you are uh, learning about things and getting more information. So that sort of works. And drawing cards is another thing that uh, also fits that because you're gaining more information and you're gaining more possibility by drawing cards. Um, also, um, it kind of makes sense that blue would have uh, better equipment and better ships than all of the other colors because if you are into science and into learning things you um, can come up with better ways of uh, building your ships, uh, more effective ways, maybe uh, you, your ships have more shields or they are ranged and so they have all of these abilities that follow uh, from you know logically from from that. Also it made sense that blue would have robots again because they're high-tech uh, and also I started giving blue some really cool and unique uh, action cards that uh, you know tampered with the, the galaxy sort of moved things around added uh, um, you know, abilities like uh, warping space and time, <laughs> getting extra turns, stuff like that. So blue would end up having a lot of really cool stuff, like a lot of really cool cards compared to a color like orange, uh, which uh, their main uh, strategy is uh, relying on physical strength of their um, of their units and uh, they have good boarding units and they maybe can build buildings because they're strong and they can build buildings faster. Uh, maybe they can heal each other, maybe fix things, but there's not really much there. And uh, it, last time it turned out that uh, all of the orange cards pretty much were the same version, different versions of the same card. And while blue had all of this enormous variety of effects, so it's very important in a trading card game that when you divide cards into groups, into colors in my case, or I don't know, factions, uh, the strength and weaknesses of all of the different factions are at least comparable, if not completely balanced. Um, so if blue is a more versatile color, it, it has more effects, but it's not overwhelmingly the most versatile color. It will be at least uh, comparable to all the other colors. So to help me uh, organize all of the effects into all of the different colors, I made this document with all of the abilities and general strategies and how they all relate to uh, the color combinations. I also made another more detailed one where I actually break down all sorts of effects uh, that you know, specific effects that cards can have and how they fit into the, all, all of the colors. That one actually took a while to make and I'm very pleased with the result, but I won't show it because um, it has classified information, let's say. <laughs> so I managed to add a lot of effects to orange cards, also green cards that also had a problem with diversity and uh, yellow as well. So I moved things around a bit. For example, blue now doesn't have the ability to just outright draw cards. Um, yellow does instead. Yellow is the color of economic dominance, so drawing cards in yellow means uh, them uh, investing in things or buying um, equipment. Blue now can look through the top cards of their arsenal, maybe pick an action card, which sort of symbolizes them coming up with a strategy, or they can um, maybe rearrange the 
top cards of their arsenal which uh, symbolizes uh, uh, they, them rethinking their actions, it's sort of that, that sort of thing. So now that all of this prep work is done, I feel much more confident in designing cards now that all the colors have a decently diverse set of skills. Hey guys, so Vasily just sent me the last final piece of card art for Multiverse Cosmic Conquest. I'm so stoked. It took so long, but finally all the planets are drawn. Okay, so first let's uh, show this one, which is uh, the red violet planet, I think. Yeah, oh yeah, shit, yeah. It was always thought of uh, to be a young planet still forming, or sort of a primordial planet. Uh, so it's still very hot and very uh, hostile to life. Uh, plus, there's still a lot of asteroids in sort of in its orbit, and uh, they crash land on it often. So it's really, really a bad place to live in. Um, Vasily sent me this version without the asteroid belt, and sort of felt a bit bland and empty. So I asked him to add some asteroids. Uh, in the background, you know, to show that it's really, uh, it's really a minefield outside, and um, uh, honestly, I think it made it a lot better. In my opinion, it added a lot of uh, detail to the background, made it more interesting. Uh, this other planet, on the other hand, just produces red resource. But wait, you might say, uh, didn't Vasily already draw the volcanic planet? Didn't that one add red resource? Aha! Well, yes, well, but uh, <laughs> that's true. Uh, we had to shift things around after re uh, introducing orange and violet to the game, and one thing that we changed around was the volcanic planet, and it now uh, pr provide, produces uh, orange and red resource instead of just red. Um, because volcanoes and mountains are really similar, and uh, for a while I wasn't really sure what to put in the red. Uh, you know, the mono red spot, uh, for a while at least, I think it was the metal planet, and then something else, and then it was like vacant, but then finally I, we just figured out that uh, having a lava planet, like with basically nothing but fire on it, was the most uh, pure form of expressing, of expressing this red strategy. So the first version that uh, Vasily sent me was this one. And again, it felt a bit, a bit uh, devoid of the uh, detail. So I sent it back to him, uh, asking to add some lava fountains that I thought could look sort of like the uh, solar flares on the sun. And yeah, he sent me this uh, version back. And again, the difference it makes is astounding. For the last few drawings, Vasily hasn't been really sending me sketches, uh, but I think it's very important to first have a sketching phase. Uh, so that uh, if uh, we need to change things and um, can do, we can do that early instead of redrawing things later once they're already you know, drawn. Uh, you have this way a bit of insurance. But thankfully we understand each other pretty well by now and uh, I ask him to draw something and he does it usually very close to what I think could work and then usually I just send the drawing back to add some more detail here and there. Uh, it's not the best system, it's not foolproof, but uh, yeah, I really insist that there should be a sketching phase even for these sort of panoramic shots uh, so we can prevent these miscommunications that could happen. Still, we managed to draw all of the planets, which is a great achievement. And you know, I might ask uh, Vasily to draw the final three uh, galaxy cards, which is the Void, the uh, nebula and the asteroid field, um, so that all of the galaxy cards can be drawn by the same artist and have a very similar feel to them. Not exactly the same style because there's a bit of variance, but uh, uh, I think it's it's cool if all of the galaxy cards will be drawn by the same person. Another very important thing to keep in mind when designing cards for your trading card game and dividing them into groups is uh, you have to figure out what kind of players uh, you will attract and what kind of uh, reasons they might have to play the game, what excites them. So obviously you have to have your combo, aggro and control uh, trio of uh, styles of play, that's very important. But uh, there's also the flavor component, um, which says that you know all, all of the 
cards in a group have to have the same flavor so if you're dividing your game into elements let's say fire water um, air and earth all of the fire cards need to feel like they belong there so maybe one cooks things one uh, blows things up one uh, I don't know <laughs> burns things uh, heat all of the different thing that fire does um, I don't know where I'm where I'm going with this, but basically all of the cards have to feel like they belong in one category. And then there's the third component, which is um, you have to account for different types of players that will play your game. Um, first of all, there's the players that uh, get the most fun when playing big splashy effects uh, that do impressive things. So in Multiverse Cosmic Conquest, uh, a card like that would be, for example, a giant robot that I don't know, uh, fires missiles, or a mechanical dragon, <laughs> things that are just over the top, maybe something that destroys planets, um, effects that are very splashy. And usually these kinds of cards cost a lot of resource in game, and uh, that makes them all the more exciting when you play them. And that's uh, a thing that uh, is very compelling to a certain group of players. Then you have a second group, which is uh, the more stereotypical tournament uh, player uh, who like uh, to think of the meta game, think of uh, what cards and what deck I should build in order to beat every other deck um, more consistently and uh, more effectively. So they, they are the um, type of player that uh, like to tinker with the, the deck and uh, kind of get the right balance of all of the different cards in order to be prepared for any type of situation and be have something ready for every type of deck that they might encounter. That's a very important type of player, especially if you have tournaments in your game. And then there's some players that just like experimenting. They like to express themselves uh, in their deck that they build, if you, if you will. Uh, they like uh, maybe combos or just enjoy the deck building process and giving themselves challenges while, while deck building. It's kind of hard to explain really, but um, it's good to have cards in your game that inspire uh, players to build around them. Um, maybe that they challenge the deck builder to try something they wouldn't do otherwise. And uh, may, even if the deck isn't good, but when it wins, it's just a sweet win. And uh, I have to say, I'm guilty of, of this myself if I play a trading card game. I usually build really wacky decks that don't uh, amount to much, but are just so fun to play because they're so weird and nobody knows what you're doing until until you, either they won or you won, uh, win. Hey guys, I don't know what's going on with my PC, but the disk is 100% busy for no apparent reason. It barely responds to my commands and it just stops working altogether. I, I tried uh, turning it off and on again and then it jumps back to 100% again. I don't know what the problem is. Even if nothing's working, it's always 100% busy. I can't work on Multiverse Cosmic Conquest with my PC in this state. Honestly, unless I fix it fast, I'll have to postpone the test session. Okay, so I finally managed to make my PC work, but as I suspected, I had to postpone the test session one week because I couldn't, I couldn't work on the PC. I, I, I couldn't finish the, the cards. Uh, also, I had an exam a few days ago, and I was getting ready for that. Uh, and I, for some reason, took some freelance work in the meantime, so I had to work on that. And I was getting really, really overworked, especially because I was also um, playtesting my other game that I'm working on. And uh, I went uh, to take my test, uh, and find, uh, actually, thankfully passed it, then I came home and immediately got incredibly sick. So that was a problem for a few days. I don't know what, what it was, but maybe it was just my body collapsing under all the pressure. But anyway, I'm, I'm better now. I'm almost done with designing the cards. And I wanted to show you this neat little thing, uh, this way of templating test cards that I, that I found uh, that uses Microsoft Word and Microsoft Excel. Uh, these things are called stickers, 
Unfortunately, my programs are in, in Russian, so I doubt that you'll understand what most of this uh, thing uh, here at the top says, but I'm sure you can find tutorials on the internet on how to make stickers. But basically, I linked the Excel card set file uh, to this Word document and divided the document into 16 stickers. By the way, I figured I could make the cards a bit smaller and fit 16 on one page, which is much more cost-effective. Uh, it's, and it's easier to cut them apart from each other. Uh, also, I had to make the font smaller, but it's not like it's a big deal. You can read with a size 12 font. It's more than enough. Anyway, uh, each space here is linked to a column, uh, to a column in the Excel sheet. And uh, I moved, uh, you know, the, the spaces around, templated the cards in a very basic way, and made it so each next sticker uh, is filled by the data on the next line of the Excel sheet. Each, it, on each sticker there's uh, uh, data on one card, so one line uh, in the Excel sheet. Each next sticker fills in the next line in the Excel sheet. Uh, so here you can see some of the planet cards and I can go here and press uh, forward and it will go to the next card. This is so useful and it saves me so much time. I can change things in the Excel sheet and then it will change automatically here uh, in Word, which is incredibly useful and I probably should have discovered this earlier and used this a long time ago, but I found it now and that's good enough. Okay, so I finally finished all of the cards. I just barely made it in time. I don't want to postpone the test session anymore. Uh, so I made the private form on our website where all the playtesters will hang out and uh, uh, first of all organize um, test games through Skype or Google Hangout and uh, there's another thread where they can discuss uh, questions on uh, the rules, the rule book and uh, the changes in the rules if, uh, you know, there will be some changes during the test session. And the third thread is about uh, feedback and, uh, you know, uh, all of the playtesters talking about their experiences. I'm so excited to finally send you guys the cards and the rulebook, uh, and I hope uh, this will be a productive test session. Okay, so you guys have been testing for a while now, some of you in real life with your friends, and some of you managed to organize a few games through Skype or Google Hangout. And I wanted to say that this third playtest session is going really well, not much feedback so far, but uh, I'm thinking it will probably morph into the fourth and then fifth playtest session. It will become this more ongoing thing. Uh, so for anyone who didn't manage to um, join and maybe uh, didn't make it in time or didn't um, sign the agreement, uh, there will be a place in Multiverse Cosmic Conquest uh, on, on our forums, uh, on the you know in the Talk Arts forums in the Multiverse um, subforum, uh, where you can join the next playtest session and. Um, I'm thinking the next, this fourth one, will be dedicated to uh, sealed uh, gameplay. So this one was constructed, the next one will be sealed. And since Booster Draft is so, is so difficult to organize, I think it will be a sealed event where uh, each player is given a number of uh, packs. Actually, how many packs? If there's 15 cards, 14 if you don't count the Galaxy card in each pack and say you open six packs and you need to build a 30 card deck. Six times 14, that's uh, 80, 84. 84 cards uh, from 30 and uh, I'm not sure, I'll have to crunch the numbers later, but uh, anyway, you open a certain number of packs and you, out of the cards that you open, you build a deck without any drafting process. So that will help out to define sort of the rarities and what needs to be uh, rare, what needs to be uncommon, what needs to be common. Uh, plus it will give you um, and give us a better uh, idea on uh, the limited environment and is it even possible to organize. Uh, hopefully it will be. Anyway, that's I think everything for this episode and uh, I'll see you guys next time. Keep it up.